Greetings, uh, brothers and sisters in YCK Chapel and friends who are tuning in to this uh, sermon. We will be covering the letter to Ephesians at our pulpit in YCK Chapel pulpit from today in January all the way to the first week of June in 2023. Today, or this week's bulletin, contains a short introduction to the letter. So do remember to grab hold of a hard copy of the bulletin or download the soft copy for your reference. The letter of Ephesians is chosen because of our theme this year, which is YCK Chapel, Unity, Diversity and Charity. You see, the city of Ephesus was a renowned Roman province in Asia. It was a wealthy port for trading, a centre for learning, it's like an educational hub. Famous also for its idol worshipping, especially for the temple, or temple to Artemis, or some call Diana. People from all over the Roman Empire will travel to the city Ephesus for trading, or for learning, and for idol worshipping. It is a metropolitan city. You can imagine people coming from all over the, the empire, from diverse cultural backgrounds to interact and to trade. The church at Ephesus therefore comprised of Jewish believers and also Gentile believers. It's almost like an international congregation or international house church. In such a multiracial context, Paul calls for unity among the members and the believers in the church of Ephesus. One that is rooted in the knowledge of God's charity, which is God's love. And Paul took the first three chapters of the letter to Ephesians to expound on God's charity that is revealed in his redemptive work of bringing all men united in Christ in one body as a family of God. In the light of God's great love, Paul also spent chapter 4 to 6 instructing the church to live a life that is radically different, that is ruled by kingdom values, that is totally different from the world around them. Noting that the city of Ephesus will truly be a city where there are so many other kinds of worldliness uh, and greed and idol worshipping that is taking place around them. So Paul urged them to live a life radically different. So chapter 1 to 3 is the necessary theological understanding of God's charity and chapter 4 to 6 is the implication of understanding God's charity. So let us begin today, uh, today's sermon by reading the passage and we're going to read Ephesians chapter 1 verse 1 to 14 together. So let's read that together. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who have blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be home, holy and blameless before Him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to Himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace, with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. Verse 7, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of His will, according to His purpose which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Verse 11, In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him, who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in Him was sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank You for gathering us together to listen to Your Word. 
And I pray that today's message will reveal your great purposes for the spiritual blessings that you bestowed us in Christ. So let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our heart be found pleasing and acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, after greeting the members in the church, Paul went into a lengthy doxology giving praise to God. This doxology is so filled with passion and enthusiasm. Paul was so overwhelmed with wonder and joy as he recounted the goodness of God, his love and his grace and mercy. You know, in the Greek manuscript, verse 4 to verse 14 is actually one complete long sentence. I suppose a modern English teacher will say, cannot do that, huh? too long. You must break the sentence into short sentences. But he was just so excited. It is as if he couldn't catch his breath when he tried to explain and describe about the spiritual blessings that God has bestowed upon us in Christ. He said, Praise be to God. Blessed be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Now this phrase, every spiritual blessings in the heavenly places, means that actually God has not withhold anything or any blessings from us. He has blessed us with every single spiritual blessing that He has according to His abundant goodness. So just think with me. God, He's a great God who created the heaven and the earth, the universe, the galaxies with abundant goodness. And this, this passage, this phrase, Paul is saying that God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. So put in context the richness of who God is. Put in context the abundant goodness of who God is. Wow, you know, it's mind-blowing. Every single spiritual blessing is bestowed on us. Another thing about this phrase, he says that this, every single spiritual blessing is in the heavenly places. Now, what does, this, what does it mean, in the heavenly places? Now, I suppose that we can contrast it with earthly places. When we think about earthly places, what comes to your mind? Well, what is in this earthly place is bounded in time and space. Therefore, it is finite, temporal, and they have aspiration date. So heavenly places means what is of eternal value, what that is not bounded by time and space, what there is, what that has no aspiration date and is not bounded for the earth consumption alone, in the earth for, for, for the earth consumption alone. In fact, the spiritual blessings that God has blessed us with stretches from before time began to the present age where we now dwell and even goes on to the end of the age into eternity. So please, why, why do I say that? Please allow me to there, therefore help us look into verse 4 to verse 14, the dosology of Paul to praise God and try to unpack these spiritual blessings altogether. Now, on this slide, I attempt to put time on the timeline. So, on, the, on your left-hand side is before time began. On the right-hand side is the end of the age, and there is where eternity begins. At the center is the present age, while we are living on earth, where there is human history, where you and I presently dwell. So with this picture, let us try to place the spiritual blessings that Paul described in verse 4 to 14 on this timeline. Let us attempt to do that and hope you'll be awed by the amazing spiritual blessings that God has bestowed upon us in Christ. So let's talk about the first spiritual blessing. In verse 4, it says, He chose us in Him before the foundation of the earth. So this blessing of being chosen by God happens even before time began. Wow! And why He chose us, or for what reason He chose us before the foundation of the earth is in order that we can become holy and blameless. And this holy and blameless is something that will happen when we finally meet the Lord face to face. Remember 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. 
It tells us that we who are at the present age are being transformed into the same image that is Christ-likeness from one degree of glory to another. The transformation of, into Christ-likeness, the transformation to become holy and bland, blameless happens at the present age when we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Saviour and it will be completed at eternity when we see the Lord face to face. And this is why I position the blessing have an overlap at the present age and to eternity on the slide. In verse 5, he went on to say that we are also predestined by God. And predestination or being predetermined by God is an act that God did before time began again. So this is another spiritual blessing that happened even before we exist. Before time began, God predestined us. For what? For the adoptions as sons. He predestined us for the adoptions as sons. That's another spiritual blessing. And this adoption as sons happened in the present age through Christ, because of Christ. Remember Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 to 5 says this, But when the fullness of time has come, God sent forth His Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. Because of Christ, the fullness of time is when Christ come on earth and died on the cross for us. And through His death on the cross, we now receive the adoption as sons. We are now being adopted uh, into the family of God. So we have now received this spiritual blessing in the present age. We are now sons of God or children of God. Now, how does this adoption take place? How does this adoption take place? God further bless us with spiritual blessings of redemption and forgiveness. That's why in verse 7, that God has redeemed us through the blood of Christ and forgiven us of our sins. And that He has also united all of us in Christ so that we become one family of God, co heirs with Christ, sons of God. Notice that in the doxology, Paul used the word sons and not children or sons and doctors, doc daughters. Not because he is a chauvinist, a sexist, that he excludes the sisters among us, but rather he's trying to highlight sonship. When we think about sonship in the Jewish culture, and actually in many cultures, sons stand to receive the inheritance from his father. And therefore, what Paul is trying to highlight is we are adopted with the sonship that we will also obtain an inheritance from God. That's why in verse 11, he says another spiritual blessing that we will all obtain an inheritance prepared for us in eternity after time, at the end of the age. After we see the Lord face to face, we will receive that amazing inheritance. And he confirmed this, that guarantee, I have, I have given you inheritance, confirm you will receive it because you are my sons. And he confirmed it by giving us the Holy Spirit as a deposit, a guarantee of sorts, or that this inheritance he promised is reserved for us in heaven. So Paul concludes in Romans chapter 8, verse 14 to 17, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not, do not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, co-heirs or fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with Him in order that we may also be glorified with Him. So here, here they are. All the spiritual blessings that Paul described in verse 4 to 14 place on this timeline. Wow! Amazing, right? To know that we stood to gain all these spiritual blessings before time began. He chose us. He predestined us. At the present age, we are adopted as sons. We are redeemed. We are forgiven. 
we are united in Christ, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit to guarantee that we might obtain the inheritance and that in the time of eternity, when we meet the Lord face to face, we shall also be totally, our sanctification, our transformation will be completed, that we'll be fully like Christ, holy and blameless. And this is our spiritual blessings that God has bestowed upon us. Notice, notice that Paul says that the spiritual blessings that God has blessed us with are in the heavenly places, not bounded by time and space. They are eternal value. They have eternal value. All this in red in the slides are things that won't go away. It is for eternity. It is something that we possess or we are given, we are bestowed on us, not by our own works, but what God has, in, by His graciousness, given to us. Now, I don't know how you feel after knowing about these spiritual blessings. Do you feel privileged? You know, this is more than winning a so-called lucky draw. Forgive me, I use the word lucky here, but, but I'm just wondering, sometimes when we receive uh, uh, news that we, we win a, 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 a draw, you know, uh, maybe first, first, you know, and we are so excited, you know. And the rest of us say, wow, you know, wow, how I wish I, all my writing of IC number to NTUC, uh, you know, receipt uh, will work. And I also want to get something like that. You know, throughout Ephesians chapter 1 to 3, Paul will further expound on these spiritual blessings. Redemption will be a theme that Paul will expound on in Ephesians chapter 2, the first part of Ephesians chapter 2. The, the blessing of uniting us in Christ will be a theme that Paul will pick up on in the second part of Ephesians chapter 2 and also the first part of Ephesians chapter 3. About the glorious inheritance will be something that Paul touched on in the second part of Ephesians chapter 1, which is next week's sermon. Transforming us to become holy and blameless is a theme that he touched on in the second part of Ephesians chapter 3 when you talk about being filled with the fullness of God. So these three chapters, for the next few weeks in our sermon, I hope you look forward to enjoy understanding all these spiritual blessings bestowed on us by God in Christ. But for today, I want to zoom in to a specific spiritual blessing to help us appreciate it even further. And there is on verse 4. He chose us. Verse 4 says, He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. This means even before time begins, before God created the world, He already knows us and chose us. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. Remember, this is what God spoke to Jeremiah. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. God already knows who we are before we exist because He's a God who dwells in timeless dimension. He is not bounded by time. You know, some critics say, if God is all-knowing, He should have already known that Adam and Eve would sin against Him and that mankind will reject Him and that this world will fall into sin and chaos. So why did He create the world in the first place? Now, verse 4 gives the answer. Yes, God already knows that the world that He created will fall into sin. God already knows that the whole world will be condemned because of her sin. But He already, before the foundation of the earth, He already has a redemptive plan in mind. Even before creation, He already has a redemptive plan in mind. He will choose some unworthy sinners to be redeemed by Christ. You know, some countries have a culture of issuing presidential pardon towards offenders and prisoners during their annual National Day celebration or some very important occasion for the nation. The president may identify maybe 20, 50 or even 100 uh, prisoners and release them from prison. Not because they have um, 
uh, 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 served their sentence full or paid for their crimes, but they are released without, their, without merit. And it is, that's why they call it pardon, presidential pardon. And I just think about it. It dawned upon me that this is what is happening to the whole world. The whole world is condemned. But God pardons. God chose and pardoned the unworthy sinners like you and me. Therefore, God's redemptive plan is not an afterthought or a backup plan. After Adam and Eve had failed him and sinned against him, then he said, oops, I didn't realize that they would do that to me. Okay, no choice. I have to think of something. Oh, maybe, okay, I'll do the redemption plan. Let me think about how to send my son to die for them. Things like this. It's not. In Revelation chapter 13, verse 8b, it says that the lamb was slaughtered before the world was made. Wow! The sacrifice of Christ was foreknown or foreordained even before creation of the world. So, God's redemptive plan is key to God's creation plan. He created the world because He wants to express His redemptive nature. God chose to create the world and bring us into existence because He will provide Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. So we owe Christ not just for our salvation. We also owe Christ for our very existence. That this world comes into existence is because of the Lamb of God. If you look at the dosology closely, closely you will realize that every spiritual blessing that God has bestowed upon us is in and through this person, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Verse 4, He chose us in Him, that's in Christ. Verse 5, He predestined us for adoption to Himself as sons through Jesus Christ. Verse 7, In Him, that's in Christ, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. Verse 10, to unite all things in Christ. Verse 11, in Him we have obtained an inheritance. Verse 13, in Him you also were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Every spiritual blessing is given to us in Christ. We are chosen in Christ. I must repeat that. We are chosen in Christ. We are predestined for adoptions as sons in Christ. We are redeemed and forgiven through the blood of Christ. We are united in Christ in one body, as one body. We will become holy and blameless just like Christ. We will obtain an inheritance because we are now co-heirs or fellow heirs with Christ. We have received the gift of the Holy Spirit because of Christ. Oh, it pleases God that before time began, the present age and eternity will all point to one person, and there is His Son, Jesus Christ. In Colossians, Paul described the centrality of Christ, saying in chapter 1, verse 15 to 20, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by Him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything He might be preeminent. For in Him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and, in, and through Him to reconcile to Himself all things whether on, he on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of His cross. Praise be to God. Praise be to Jesus Christ, God the Son. But what is the purpose of God doing all these things? Why did He choose to bestow us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ? What is God's purpose of choosing us, adopting us, redeeming us, forgiving us, and giving us an inheritance in Christ. What is God's purpose of pointing all things to the cross and to Christ? Verse 6 says, It is to the praise of His glorious grace. 
verse 12, to the praise of His glory. Verse 14, to the praise of His glory. The resounding reason that Paul gave is that God has bestowed us uh, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ is to the praise of His glorious grace and to the praise of His glory. So what's the difference between His glorious grace and glory? Are they two different things? No, they are the same thing. You know, in Exodus chapter 33, verse 18 to 19, Moses asked God and said, I want to see your glory. And God responded positively. He said in verse 19, I will make my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. When Moses asked to see God's glory, God revealed that His glory is about His grace and mercy. So, to praise God's glorious grace is to praise God's glory. It is the same thing. Now, do you know what is the longest standing ovation given to a person ever recorded in history? This person, a Spanish tenor, I hope I pronounced his name correctly, Placido Domingo, holds the record for the world's longest standing ovation with 101 curtain calls, go in, go out, go in, go out, you know, lasting more than 80 minutes after a performance of Otello in Vienna in 1991. Wow. Imagine, you know, he, present, he was singing, you know, opera, and everybody stood up and clapped. He bowed his head, don't know, 100 times, then walked in. Then they're still clapping. He had to come out again. Come in, come out again, come in, come, come out again. 80 minutes. What an honour. What an honour given to a human being who is also a sinner just like you and I. The purpose of God bestowing us Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ is in order that it may result in everlasting praise of His glorious grace. It may result in everlasting standing ovation of His glorious grace. You know, I wonder how the angels feel when they witness God's redemptive plan at the cross of Christ and begin to understand God's grace and mercy for sinful, sinful creatures like you and me. You know, I believe that they are in all in heaven and giving God the longest standing ovation or worship, bracketed worship for His gracious and glorious grace. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7 to 8. In Him, we have redemption through His blood the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace which He lavished upon us. You know, the word lavish is a very beautiful and profound word. It means to give extravagantly, to give exceedingly more than you need. Or some use this very simple but more, um, uh, I feel that it's, it's, it's clearer, is it's to wastefully pour out and give out to somebody. I suppose an, a demonstration of this word lavish is needed. So I'm going to now go into a demonstration. Okay, for this demonstration, uh, we're going to use this cup. You know, this is a communion cup to represent us. This is me. Who wants to be this cup? Anyone? Yeah, this is our Kuching Kurak life. All right, our unworthy sinner. Us as unworthy sinner. I'm going to ask Sister Christine to come forward to hold on to this cup. Yeah. And then he'll just put near to the pail because what I'm going to demonstrate to you is what it means when the scriptures say that the riches of his grace that, that he lavished on us, which means give extravagantly, exceedingly, wastefully pour out. So this represents the grace of God. And I'm going to pour into our Kuching Kura life. Hey, wait a minute. I think this one doesn't work. 
I think this one bigger. Ah, extravagantly, the riches of His grace. Wait, wait, it's a bit too small still. Let me use this. All right, let me use this. Wait, wait, wait. I think this is the better way to represent the riches of His grace. Extravagantly, exceedingly pour out into our life. Wastefully pour out. He chose us before the foundation of the earth. He predestined us as adoptions, as sons of God. He unites us in Christ, redeem us, forgive us, obtain an inheritance to be holy and blameless, sealed with the Holy Spirit. This is the grace of God lavished on, upon us, upon our lives so richly and extravagantly. And this is the grace of God. If you and I truly understand the dosology in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4 to 14, if we truly understand the spiritual blessings bestowed on us in Christ, if we truly understand what Christ has accomplished for us at the cross, we will be standing and giving God the longest standing ovation and honour. And I believe this is what we will do for the rest of eternity when we see the Lord face to face. Now, this is why Paul prayed in Ephesians chapter 3 that we may seek to know the breadth, the length, the depth and the height of the love of Christ which is immeasurable. It takes eternity to measure the immeasurable love of God and the grace of God. Oh, just a glimpse. Just a glimpse of that understanding will cause us to join the heavens and the angels to give him the longest standing ovation. Let's do that now in prayer. Lord, thank you. I don't know what else to say, Lord. No words can express my heartfelt thanks to be the recipients of all the spiritual blessing before time begins at the present age and what is in store for me in eternity. Who am I, Lord? I'm just an unworthy sinner. We are just unworthy sinners and yet you chose us. You pardon us and gave us every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for dying on the cross. We owe you not just our salvation, we owe you our existence. Without you, we are truly nothing. We worship you. We honour you. We give you praise. We bless your name every day and forever and ever. Blessed be our God the Father who has blessed us with every spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in and through Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Saviour. Amen. <laughs>